Go ahead and get your Bible open. We'll, we'll start here in Colossians, move our way forward. Colossians chapter 1, while I ramble for a little bit. But anyway, when I was, uh, after my first year of Bible college, they, I got um, the privilege to travel with a singing group that the college was going to use to promote the school. Um, we were going to travel from church to church singing gospel music talking about our experience at Hillsdale College and so on. And um, they said that it's going to be, um, you have to audition, and it's going to be male uh, four-part a cappella barbershop style quartet, which is right up my alley. And uh, they was going to pay us, I think we got paid $150 a week. Now, this is 1985. Ain't bad. For a 19-year-old boy making $150 a week singing and having all the expenses paid, uh, there was a donor that offered to underwrite the entire trip. In other words, he's going to pay the gas bill, hotel bills, food bill, everything, uh, including the insurance bill for the van that I wrecked. So my, my most vivid memories of being in the area of Idaho, uh, Wyoming, places like that, we had, we left on a Wednesday afternoon, we left Oklahoma City. The next day, Brother George, I'm standing looking over the rim of the Grand Canyon, and I said, I did the right thing. It was either that or go home for the summer, go back to Missouri for the summer. So I'm looking at the edge of the Grand Canyon. If you've ever seen pictures of the Grand Canyon, you've never seen the Grand Canyon. Because the pictures don't do it. You have to see it. So anyway, we traveled through uh, New Mexico, Arizona, up through California. Stopped at a few places. We were in Oregon, Wenatchee, Washington. Um, then we went to Boise, Idaho. And the pastor there uh, ended up being a good friend of mine, him and his wife. He's now gone on to be with the Lord. But we sang at his church in Boise, Idaho. And then we had to be in Kansas City within a few days. So we decided we had to leave right after the service and we were going to drive all night, drive all day, try to get as far as we could, maybe one stop over and then be in Kansas City. So I started out the first shift, going two, two hour shifts. I'm driving the first shift out of Boise and we're going down through uh, Boise and through Idaho into Wyoming. And after my two-hour shift, I crawled back in my bench, and I didn't sleep very much, slept a little, but I didn't sleep very much. So early in the morning, about five or six o'clock in the morning, I ended up being riding shotgun, and the president of the college was riding with us, and he was driving. And he, we saw a sign that said there was a truck stop up ahead. This is in Wyoming. And it's early in the morning. And he said, Mike, I'm getting sleepy. Are you awake? And I said, yeah, I'm wide awake. He said, I'm afraid I'm going to fall asleep. He said, can you take over and drive? He said, there's a truck stop up here just ahead. He said, we'll pull over there. We'll switch drivers, wake the other boys up, eat breakfast, and we'll move on. I said, sound like a plan. So I got behind the wheel. And I hadn't been driving 10 minutes. And I fell right asleep. And four-lane highway was the two lanes that we were in had a shoulder and then about a 30 foot embankment. And I was in the left hand lane and back then speed limit's 55 and I know I had to be doing 70 probably. And what I remembered was going to sleep and then I remember, boom, I hit a car in front of us in the other lane, in you know the right hand lane. And that woke me up. Had I not hit that car, the way I was going, I was headed off the road. I'd have killed everybody in that van. They was all asleep. None of us had seatbelts on. It's the 80s. I'd have killed everybody, including myself, and God allowed me to hit that car. And, that, I mean, that scared me. And so we went ahead, and they pulled over. It's an old beat-up car. They pulled over, and we drove to the truck stop and called the state patrol and they came and they, the guy, bless his heart, he knew I was scared to death, 19 years old, had this, and he said, just calm down. 
He said, these guys work in the mines here in Wyoming. And he said, now they make probably $25 an hour, both of them. And he said, they got a brand new Ford pickup truck there in the driveway. This is the beat up car they drive to work every day. It's worth $500 tops. They're, they're gonna total it out. I hit his back, his, his rear end, didn't do much damage to the church van. And he said, tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll get you for doing 65 and a 55. It's a $15 fine, no points off your license. And I said, here's $20. <laughs> so I didn't drive the rest of the day. I, that scared me. So we made it to North Dakota or South Dakota, one of the two, or Nebraska. Anyway, so I called my mom and I said, Mom, I got some news to tell you. And she said, I got something to tell you too. And I said, well, mom, just hang on a minute. We were in an accident. I was driving. I fell asleep at the wheel, but we're okay. And she said, fine. How come you flunked chapel? <laughs> that was the end of that conversation. All right, Colossians chapter one. So most of what I remember of the Wyoming, Montana area was not a fun experience. Colossians chapter one. Um, I'm going to pick up here, not going to say much. We're going to move on to a different topic. We're talking about the gospel and salvation. Let's read Colossians 1.23 and we'll go to prayer. Uh, the Bible says, if you continue in the faith, if, and that's the if, and I believe in that if, if God didn't want it in there, it wouldn't be in there, but it's there. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So he's establishing this, establishing this idea that salvation, again, never of works. Now, he's not talking about a work here. He's not talking about if you continue to be good. He did not ever say that. Continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. Okay, and that's the if of salvation. And to me, to my knowledge, it's the only if of salvation. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's good to be with your people tonight. And Lord, we thank you for those that have gathered here, those who've gathered online. We ask your blessings upon each and every one. We do thank you, God, for allowing us the liberty, the freedom to come into your house to worship you. Father, we're living in dangerous times right now. And many people around the world do not have the permission by their government to even come and sit in your house and study your word. What a shame that is. So, Father, there's no doubt that there is an attack on our faith. You saw this coming. So, Father, now is the beginning of the testing. And you're trying our faith. You, God, know how it's going to turn out. We, Father, hope and our trust, and it's not a wish, we hope, Father, in you and only in you. Help us, dear God, to continue trusting you and you alone. Bless your word tonight. Fill our hearts with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Give us that gift tonight. Bless each and every one that hears the word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... He reiterates this, 1 Timothy chapter 2, notwithstanding, she shall be saved. I did cover this last Wednesday night, but very quickly. She shall be saved in childbearing if, there's that if again, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. The key is faith. Continuing in faith. Keep believing that book. Keep believing what God said. Who in here, who is older than me, has ever seen people at one time, they, you thought they believed the Bible, and then something happened, and then they didn't believe it anymore. You ever seen that, Sterling? Brother George, you ever seen that? Believed the Bible one day, didn't believe it? We used to hear a story around here. God told us that there was a man went to, I mean, a King James fundamental church, was a deacon in that church. And then he saw the light, and now he's a Roman Catholic priest. What happens to somebody like that? They didn't continue. They didn't trust God. They stopped 
maybe he didn't believe to begin with. Okay? Maybe he just didn't buy it to be and put on a show for everybody. Who knows? 1 Timothy 4, 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. This is Paul telling young Timothy this, a bishop, new bishop of a church. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And, by, and I'll say this, and this is what Paul's saying here. You continuing in the faith does not only benefit you in a, because you, are, have, you have an enduring relationship with God and an enduring belief in what God said, but you then are an example to others who watch your life and can say of you, you know, I know a man, he's been through some tough times, but he's always praised God. He's always said the Bible is right in everything that it says. He's always done that. I could only hope to have faith like that. Because I'm telling you, people watch you. Especially if you were to fall away and fall out. Now, that's why I asked who in here has known somebody. You've seen them. You watch them. One day they said to believe the Bible. And then all of a sudden, boom, they don't believe it anymore. And they're out. Does that not have an effect on other people who've watched their lives? Of course it does. Well, I used to go to church and I'd see people there that I thought was saved and I got away from God and I would start going to the bars and I'd see the same people over there. You think that guy's ever going to go back to church? Not likely. Not unless God intervenes in his life. It makes a difference. When you keep trusting God, you are an example to others. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast heard, hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And the key is, do you trust the source of your doctrine? Do you trust it? Now, I'm positive. I am 100% positive that out of all the people who listen to what I got to say each and every week, not everybody would agree with everything that I say. I don't care about that. What concerns me is, do you trust the source of what you believe? Which is the word of God. 1 John 2, 22, 2, Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain. See that word if? If. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you. Ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And again, it's about faith never works. Faith never works. All right, now. Matthew chapter 20, turn there. Let's spend a little time with this. Now, to set this idea up, and again, this is based on, I didn't read somebody's book about salvation. I didn't go to the Christian bookstore. I didn't order something online that taught me about salvation. And there's thousands of books written on the, on the subject. But I wanted to know from the book that I trust, what is salvation? And I wanted to know everything that I could know about it. So thank God that we have a tool now, Pure Bible Search software, and I use it. I use it. And people are seeing some awesome things. They're sharing it with me. I love it. So what I did was I, I typed in and searched the scripture for every place in the Bible that it said save, saved, saying, or saving, salvation, savior, you name it. Anything related to salvation that I could think of, I'd write it down on a list. And then I went, typed it in, and I read every single verse in the Bible. Did it take a long time? Yes, it did. Was it worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I know what I believe now. I'm, I'm convinced of it. So this idea comes up. I'm sure some of you have probably heard it. That says, well, everybody's always saved. Once saved, always saved. But those who fall away, they're still saved. They just won't get near the rewards in heaven that others will get. Now, I've heard that. 
For some, the people that, when I ask the question, have you ever seen somebody said they believe the Bible one day and all of a sudden they didn't believe it no more thereafter and still to this day, or they may have died in that condition. There are those who would say, oh, they're still in heaven. Even though they called God a liar, they left the faith, they turned reprobate, they're still in heaven. It's just that they won't get as big a piece of the pie in heaven as somebody else will. So now let, I'm going to compare me and Sterling. Obviously, if we were to be judged on how worthy we are by our age, Sterling would win hands down. I try to preach seven sermons a week, every week. Try to, don't always make it. But that's my goal, it used to be nine. But at least seven, seven different messages a week, every week. Whether it's Sunday school teaching, morning preaching, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Watchman broadcast, Pastor Mike online. Or anything that comes in my mind and I, I think I need to address it in like a special way. So I try to do that every week. That's my goal. And Brother Sterling has not, to my knowledge, ever preached a single message. It's never happened. To my knowledge, I've never seen him behind a pulpit letting everybody have it. Never seen it. So, how then does God judge me against him? Do I get a higher reward, a closer position to God, a bigger mansion? My street of gold is paved wider than his street of gold. I mean, tell me, please. How God gives me more in eternity than he does Brother Sterling. Because he doesn't preach seven sermons a week. And I do. So how does God do that? I believe that. To whom much is given, much is required. And I've been given a, a certain ability. Um... To speak in front of people. He doesn't have that ability. Does he serve God? Sure he does. I've watched this man's life. I've known him for years. Okay. I know his, I know his strengths. I know his shortcomings. He knows mine. So look at Matthew 20. And here's actually. This passage here is what. And be, let me say this. Believe it or not. There are even some who say that there is a place in heaven where they weep and gnash teeth. You ever heard that one, Brother George? I ha I've read it. I've read preachers who taught that. That obviously in heaven, there is a place where people weep and gnash teeth because they didn't do as much as other people did. Now... Did I not just teach you that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So how does God judge me? How does God judge Josiah back there? Not by what we do or how much of it we do. Do you believe every word in this Bible, Josiah? So if I believe every word in this Bible, does that not make me equal with you? John, is there a word here that you say, I don't know, that, I, that, probably, that word don't look right. Is that, that's, that's, you don't believe that, do you? So how then are you not equal with me? You are. I believe what God said, you believe what God said. And so they use this passage here to justify the teaching that God gives more reward to some people than he does others. But let's examine, exa and I'm glad that we all use in the same Bible, aren't you? Same, same, the manager sent down his guidelines for us to follow. And we're all reading out the same manager's manual, amen? 
So look at this, Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them out into his vineyard. And he went about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. They had just got done with a riot, an Antifa riot. They had burnt down some buildings and they didn't have anything else left to do. So the man said, hey, you want to work? You believe that? They didn't want to work. They said, no, we, we're fine. George Soros is paying all our bills. Amen. So he went about the third hour and saw others standing out in the marketplace. And he said unto them, go you also out into the vineyard. And whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And again, it went about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out, found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand you here idle all the, idle, all the day idle? They stand him because no man hath hired us. And he said, Go ye also into the vineyard. Whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, and the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last to the first. In other words, the guys that were hired at the eleventh hour, they're first. And when they came, so remember, he who is last shall be first, he who is first shall be last. That's, I believe that's why that's there. So when they, when they that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying... These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered unto them, saith, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. And I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Who owns it? God does. Cannot God do with it what he wants to do with it? And listen, any time, you young people, listen to me. You all are about to enter into a realm where somebody is going to tell you about socialism and the benefits of taking from the rich and giving and distributing it equally amongst everybody else, even though you didn't earn it. Don't buy that garbage. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give it unto his last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me for do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I'm good? So the last shall be first and the first last for many be called but few chosen. Now, what, is that, what does that tell you? What illustration do you gain from what Jesus said in this passage? Who got more than a penny? Nobody. Who got a penny? Everybody. Was there anybody that worked that didn't get a penny? No. They all got a penny. They all worked. They all got the same amount. When the grandkids come in in the morning, Jaden, Uriah, Michaela, Journey, Hope, she's not my grandkid, but when they all come in in the morning, they stand at the door, they hear me talking, they know not to disturb me. But when they, as soon as I shut my mouth, they say, can we have candy? So how many pieces do you get, Hope? Do I give Uriah more than you? No. He gets a piece, you get a piece, Journey gets a piece, Action Jackson got a piece. Must have made him sleepy. Look at there, man. I'll send some of that home with y'all, all right? They, yay! They all got the same amount. Everybody got the same. God's, God makes it all equal, doesn't he? Now, let's take... I'm going to move through some of this and go to a different parable that Jesus taught on this issue. Matthew 25. Turn there. This is actually what I was thinking of. I got my parables mixed up. But in this parable here, this is the one, John, where they say God gives more to those who worked more. Now, 
let's stop before we read this and let's analyze these thoughts that we just that we just received. Jesus just taught a parable where people worked different lengths of the day, but they all got paid the exact same wage. What do you expect then out of a parable that involves somebody giving something? Do you think that God is going to be unequal? He never is. And I, I mean, I said it yesterday and I've preached this before. God thinks an unjust balance is an abomination. God thinks that is. He doesn't like anybody tipping the scales, putting their thumb on the scales, outweigh. He doesn't like that. He's, I hate it, he said. So now look at what this says. Matthew 25, 14, for the kingdom of heaven. Again, kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. And he called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents. And to another two. And to another one. And to every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. Now everybody's got an ability. Everybody does. Everybody's got a unique quality that God has put in them. That God works through that unique quality. You have it and I don't. And there are things that I can do as a pastor. And there are things other pastors do that they can run circles around me with it. Because they do it 50 times better than I can ever do. I, there are things that I just stink at in the ministry. I'm not good at it. So that's why the, the, the Lord here says he knows this man. He's servant of his. He's known him for years. He said, I'm going to give you five talents. Why? Because I know I can, you can handle five. I know you. And to this guy here, I know you can handle two. And this guy here, I'm going to give you one. Now let's see what you do with it. Maybe after a while you might graduate to two, maybe to five. But let's start with one for now. He knows his people and he knows what they can do and what they can't do. So watch this. Verse 16. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. What, what percentage did he increase? 100% increase, right? Now look. Verse 17. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. What was his percentage of increase? 100%. Same as the other guy. Same as the other guy. In fact, have you ever had a bank account anywhere where you got a 100% return on your investment? It would be nice. I wouldn't complain. Amen. But look at, that's what he said. Look at the, look at how God distributes this. And everybody that gets what they've been given, they bring back a hundredfold. 100% double. Verse 18. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou hast delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Now I want you to underline the exact words. That the Lord said. He said unto him. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Because thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou in, into the joy of the Lord. I want you to underline those words. You can even count them. Now watch this. Because I've had people get mad at me. Because I won't go along with what they're trying to twist the scriptures into. Because they say, obviously, see, God blesses some and gives them greater rewards than others. But look at what it says. Verse 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. Now look at the exact words that the Lord said. His Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. 
Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Show me a difference between what the Lord said to the two men. If you can show me a difference between them, I'll give you $50 right now. Honey, I need $50. Can you show me a difference between what the Lord said to those two men? Not a word. Melissa's counting them. What'd you come up with? Oh, you're not done yet, are you? Okay. You count, you count the other one. They got the exact same blessing. Enter thou into the what? Joy of the Lord. That was their reward. The ability to enter the joy of the Lord. That was their reward. The wording to both men was exactly identical. Was it not? So how could anybody say that the man who gained five talents gets a bigger reward than the man who brought back two talents. When the scripture doesn't say it, you can't either. Now look at, look at this. In verse, 20, um, verse 24, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou, that, there, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked, wicked, wicked servant. What happens to the wicked? Cast in the lake of fire. Thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, gather where I have not strawed. And I think the Lord here would have said, and it ain't none of your business. It ain't none of your business. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him. Now what does the man have? Nothing. And give it unto them which have ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And this is where they get it, Brother George. I have read, I believe it or not, Chuck Missler said it. You know who Chuck Missler is? He said it. If I'm right, if I remember right. Because I went looking for who believed this. And I read several articles that said... Because everybody gets different rewards. Obviously, there is a place in heaven where they weep and gnash teeth. Because look at what it said. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, where is outer darkness? Where is outer darkness? It's in hell. You read, you read your Bible. Is there any darkness in heaven? No, and not ever. Is there any weeping in, in heaven? How do we know that? God said he wipes the tears from their eyes. Is there any gnashing of teeth in heaven? But where is gnashing of teeth taking place right now? In hell. I cannot fathom. I cannot fathom someone wanting to support a doctrine so bad that they would go to the extent to say, obviously there must be a place in heaven where maybe even for a period of time they are in darkness and they weep and gnash teeth. But some say it. So from what I can see in scripture, both profitable servants, they both brought back, as far as percentage goes, they both brought back the exact same percentage and they were both given the exact same words of blessing. And the final part of that was, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Now, I cannot find a place anywhere in Scripture 
where it describes heaven as having a good side and a bad side, a mediocre side, a poor side, other side of the track side. I don't see that anywhere in your Bible. Now let's back up a little bit in my notes. Matthew chapter 5. I, I must have liked this verse so much, I pasted it in here twice. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Who's going to get a great reward in heaven? Everybody. Great is your reward in heaven. Now, I do see in this earth, again, there are pastors who can do things that I just, I can't do it. I'm just not good at it. Their pastors go out street preach. I, that's not me. Their pastors that, I mean, they preach good. They preach good and they know how to fill parking lot and they know how to fill pews. I don't. And if you think I haven't tried in 25 years, but I like what God's given me. I'm not complaining. Not at all. So, just because some preachers are better at something than other preachers are, that doesn't mean that they're going to get something or a part of heaven that I just want. There's going to be a barrier there. It's going to be a chop zone and I won't be able to go into it. I just don't, I don't see that. Matthew 6, 6, but when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall do what? He shall reward thee openly. Luke chapter 6. Verse 20. The Bible says, He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. The poor people. And what did they get? According to this verse, what do the poor get? And of course, you know, understand it would be the poor who trust in Jesus, right? What are they going to get? The kingdom. Not a piece of the kingdom, not a chunk of the kingdom, not a fifth of the kingdom. They're going to get... The kingdom. The kingdom. Uh, verse 21. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be what? Do some get half filled? Filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil. For the Son of Man's sake, rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers under the prophets. Jesus just said that you're going to get the reward that the prophets, the guys that wrote the Bible, are going to get. Same reward. And what is it? Heaven. Eternity, joy with God forever. I mean, my goodness, we know that when we leave this earth, we're not taking big chunks of gold with us, right? What is it when we are in heaven that we will lack? Nothing. I used to think that word was like. And I had an old lady live next to us, Grandma Bonds. Mom had to leave me with her for a little while and I had my homework to do. And she, I said, she said, how much do you like? And I went, I don't like any of this. Because I wanted to quit. No, how much do you like? So, well, I don't like this page. I don't like that page either. Can I quit and go out and play? I didn't understand what she meant, lack. I didn't get that. Look at verse 35. But love, Luke chapter 6, verse 35, but love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be what? Great. And you shall be children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. But be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. 
Now, in this, let's just say in this little pod of people right here, do you think that God has had to forgive maybe some people in this very room of more things than he has had to forgive others? But let me ask you a question then. Once he has forgiven you of everything, what then is there against you? Nothing. Nothing. If we believe and teach that Christ forgives all manner of sins. And if I committed 85 sins one day. And John only committed 30 one day. At the end of the day, we are both forgiven completely. Then what is it that makes me not equal with John? Not a thing. And John has already said, I believe every word in this book. But John, do you understand every word in this book? Is it possible that I, that I might understand maybe a little bit more than you understand? But we both believe every single word. So in that sense, since we are saved by grace through faith, what is it about me that makes me any different than John? Not one thing. Not one thing. And the works that we do, who actually did those works? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Who does the works through us? God does. Jesus does. So how then could we be credited for work for God's kingdom when it wasn't us to begin with that did it? Can't be. 1 Corinthians 3. Which is more important now? Look at these, look at these two people. Paul and Apollos. Now understand the nature. Paul was not a long-term bishop or pastor. That, that was one thing that he wasn't. What we know from the Bible is that Paul went from place to place. He did not go and build on another man's foundation. We know that. He refused to. So every place that Paul went was clean. There was no churches there. Paul went preaching boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ in a brand new place to people who had never heard it before. And he brings disciples and then he teaches them and they form a congregation. They start meeting, having services. Paul is their preacher. They're adding people. People are getting saved. Family members are getting saved. The church is growing. Paul is being led by the Holy Spirit. He sees a man there that God's going to work through him and God's going to raise him up to be a bishop. Paul works with him, trains him, teaches him in the doctrine, teaches him how to be a bishop, make sure he's qualified, lays hands on him as bishop, and then when Paul is satisfied that that church is ready to go, he leaves and goes somewhere else. So, look at what he said here. 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I have planted, Apollos watered. Now, ask a question. Which one of these two is more important? Neither one. Neither one. The fact that Paul planted means that he wasn't there near as long as Apollos was. I mean, you, pl you only plant one time a year, right? But how long do you water? Every day. So out of the two, Paul and Apollos, who then do you think got a greater portion of heaven? Neither one. Because who actually brought the increase? According to that verse, God did. And it wasn't Paul and it wasn't Apollos, either one. Have you not ever planted something and nothing happened? A story of my life. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So that neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth. But God that gives the increase. So out of, let's take all the Christians together and combine them into a group. 
and then ask the question between us and Jesus Christ, who then deserves the greater glory? Jesus does, hands down. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are, are what? One. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. But he just said they are both one. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry and you are God's building. If we were to take that idea and go back to John 15 and look at that passage. John 15 verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. For if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them in the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Now ask the question, how many groups of people are seen in this little teaching here? How many groups of people are, are talked about here in this passage right here? How many? There's only two. Those who bear fruit and those who don't. What happens to those who bear fruit? They get to remain on the vine. What happens to those who do not bear any fruit whatsoever? They are cut off and cast into the fire. There is only two groups here. And what difference does it make, John? You're our vine, you're our vinearian. Vinatarian. What difference does it make? What vine produces how many grapes if they're all producing grapes? That's the objective. So in this passage here, who is it that gets more? And I'm talking about in heaven. Who is it that gets more in heaven than somebody else? There's no difference. There's no difference. There's only two groups here. You either... You either let God bear fruit in you or you don't and God cuts you off, casts you in the fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, there is one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six things here. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. Now we're talking about fire again. Now look at these six things here. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. And ask the question. There are six things here, and yet if the fire were to come, which of these would survive the fire and which would not survive the fire? Gold, silver, precious stones will survive. The wood, hay, and stubble will not. So how many groups are there? There's six things. That there, there's two groups. So look at it. Because it shall be, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire tr shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built there, thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Two groups here. Okay. Um, Colossians 3, 23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall re receive the reward of the, in of the what? Inheritance. The inheritance. So now, what is the reward of being a Christian? The inheritance. And what and on what basis is an inheritance given? Sonship. You have to be an offspring of the man to inherit the inheritance. 
So now we're back again. There's still two groups here. There are those who are children and there are those who are not children. Of the children, does any of them not get an inheritance? No. They all get an inheritance. Of those who are not children, does any of them get an inheritance? No, none of them do. You can apply that genetically. Who got your genes? Your kids. Okay? My mama, we're going to go to prayer in a minute. My mama called me yesterday to see how I was doing because she said I inherited her genes. I said, which ones is that? She said, falling down all the time. <laughs> Brother George, Monday night we was eating supper at Rich's frozen custard, which you ought to go to. If you come to Festus, go to Rich's. Amen. And we was eating out on their little front patio. used to be Dairy Queen, right? We was eating out on their little front patio. And we all got up. And I didn't see that that was a step down. And we was parked like from... My car was where Sterling is from where I'm standing right now. And I didn't see that step. And I went off of there. And I went... Bam! On the ground. And I scuffed this hand up. And this knee bled like crazy. Bent, bent my glasses. Lindsay said she, I smashed my face down in the ground. She thought I was going to have a black eye. But this part of the glass, Lindsay, saved my face. Yeah. Because I can take all the good looks I got. I'm going to keep them, all right? This, this bore the brunt of it right there. Okay. Well, where did I get that from? I inherited that from my mom. I fall all the time. Trust me. Yeah. I pass it down to my kids faithfully. So look at, let me finish this. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive it for the wrong which he hath done. And there is what? No respect of persons. If you are a child of God, you get an inheritance. And what difference does it make? Because with Christ, we are what kind of heirs? Joint heirs with Jesus. So does not the Bible say that God will withhold no good thing from his children? That means every good thing you and I are going to get. Every bit of it. It belongs to all of us. The new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, all of it is going to be all of ours together. And there'll be no jealousy over who's sitting, you're sitting, in my, excuse me, you're sitting in my seat in heaven. That's, that kind of stuff's going to fade away. Amen! Amen. Uh, you're in my seat, Jack. I worked hard for that. You've got to give me that. That's not going to be that nonsense. Cut that stuff out. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you, I'll tell you this. We'll take prayer because Abraham was told by God that he said, I am thy exceeding great reward. What was Abraham's reward? God was. And what piece of God are you not going to get? Because you've got all of him. Amen.